Hi everyone, and welcome to my dining room table. My name is Simon D'Entremont. I'm a working nature and wildlife photographer in Eastern Canada in Nova Scotia. And today I'm gonna to be walking you through all of my gear. Even though I put a link on all my YouTube videos to my website that has a My Equipment page, I get lots of questions. So I'm going to do a video on all the gear that I use. Now, a bit of a disclaimer here. I'm not saying I've tried every brand of product and that these are necessarily the best. I'm just gonna show you what I've been using. And yes, they all work. I wouldn't be using them otherwise. If I use a product and it's not working for me, I move on to something else and everything here works well for me. If you are interested in buying any of these products, I'll put links in the description below. And if you buy them using those links, I get a small commission at no charge to you. Why don't we start with the big guy? This is my Canon F4 500 millimeter lens version two. This was launched in about 2012, 2013, it's still in production today. Will be replaced by the RF version, that is the mirrorless version in the next few years, I hope. And its replacement, I expect to be the first super telephoto lens designed from scratch for the mirrorless system. This lens is super sharp, including wide open at F4, has a great image stabilization system, produces great contrast, blows out the background because of its thin depth of field, has a super fast autofocus system, and with that weighs eight pounds, so it's a bit heavy. I am looking forward to its replacement in the RF system that I hope will shed a couple of pounds. I'll show you some pictures now that I've taken with this lens. I've taken photos like this, this, and this. This takes great pictures. When I'm going for shorter hikes, I may go for the Canon 100 to 400, version two. This is a really, really good lens for walking around. It's quite sharp, really good, especially on my full frame cameras. Great for walking around at a local duck pond or getting in uncomfortable angles at a duck pond, like getting down really low and using your LCD screen because it doesn't weigh that much. This takes great photos and I've taken photos like this, this, and this using this lens. Great lens. As for camera bodies, my main camera body right now is the Canon R5. This is a fantastic camera for lots of uses, including wildlife. 12 frames per second, image stabilized sensor, 45 megapixels. I actually have a video comparison of this to the R6 if you guys are interested. Articulating LCD screen, great autofocus, eye detect, which works great on animals, especially birds. This is a fantastic wildlife camera. I do have the battery grip for it and the R6, but to be honest, I like the small form factor of this and the battery life uh, is still pretty good. I've taken photos with this camera that include this, this, and this. This is a fantastic camera. I also have the Canon R6 that I'm filming with right now. I'll show you a little bit of footage of the R6, which is a great camera. I'm using that as a vlogging camera, but also I'm shooting time lapses like right here with it. I like shooting B-roll with it for my YouTube videos, and it's also great for photography. It has a 20 megapixel sensor, so it has fewer megapixels and less resolution, but it has many of the same features of the R5, including an image stabilized sensor, the same autofocus system, 12 frames per second, and a great autofocus system. So it too is a great wildlife camera. Other cameras I have, this is a 7D Mark II, an older technology now, but still a relevant wildlife camera. If you're currently shooting now with a T3 or a, a T3i or T7 or something like that, and you want to upgrade a little bit, buy one of these guys use, 10 frames per second, really good autofocus system. I've taken lots of great photos with this camera. I'll show you a few of those right now. I also have another camera, I have a Canon M50. This is something I bought for vlogging. It doesn't get a lot of use anymore, but if I ever was going to vlog something that might put the camera in danger, I'd use this over the R6. This is an APS-C sensor, but still a very good sensor. This is a very, very good camera. If you're ever looking to get into vlogging at some point, this is a very compelling alternative. You need something with a decent sensor. You want something with a articulating screen so that when you're vlogging, you can see yourself. And you want something with an external microphone jack. So if you take something like this little external shotgun mic and put it on here, plug it in there, with a little flippy screen, this is a great upgrade from using your phone, for example, if you want to do some vlogging. Now let's talk teleconverters for a second. I've got the two times and the 1.4 teleconverter. These are version three from Canon for EF lenses. I use these on my 500 millimeter lens, very rarely on my 100 to 400. 
I use the 1.4 almost 90% of the time on my 500 millimeter lens. The two times can work, but it comes with some limitations. You need really good technique and really good conditions to maximize the benefits of the two times. But the 1.4 I use on my super telephoto lens shot wide open and the photos are still tack sharp. A caution that you can't put a teleconverter on any lens and get great results. Your lens needs to be super, super sharp and have some unresolved sharpness that the teleconverter can bring out. If you put them on an unsharp lens, you're just gonna get bigger, blurrier photos. Reserve these for really, really sharp lenses. So some other lenses that I use on a regular basis. This is the Sigma Art Series 50 millimeter 1.4. I use this for astrophotography. I use this for shooting B-roll. I use it for some commercial work that I do. Uh, I don't shoot portraits, but if I did, this would be a very, very good portrait lens. It really blows out the background, very, very sharp. And I use it for filming some of my YouTube videos. I also have the Sigma Art Series 20 millimeter 1.4. This is my main Milky Way lens. This is a fantastic lens. It has just the right field of view for me for Milky Way shots. Uh, longer focal lengths like 28 and so on I find are just a little bit too tight for the Milky Way and even though I've shot the Milky Way at something like 14 millimeters I find that's a little bit too wide. 20 millimeters is a great focal length for the Milky Way and this lens at f1.4 lets in four times more light than an f2.8 lens. So if someone is shooting the Milky Way with an f2.8 lens and shooting at ISO 6400 I can be right next to them shooting at 1.4 at ISO 1600. So this gives me very clean images. It's very sharp, but sometimes I'll shoot it at 1.6, 1.8 to clear up some of the coma in the edges. Uh, I've taken great Milky Way shots with this. I'll put a few of them up on the screen there right now. Here's another lens I use primarily for astrophotography. This is the Samyang F2 135 millimeter lens. This is a great beginner lens for deep space astrophotography. If you have a star tracker or a mount that can't handle a big lens, this is 135 millimeters at f2. Super fast. It's manual focus, but astrophotography is all manual focus anyway. So this is a great way to get into deep space astrophotography without having a big heavy rig. I'll show you a photo that I've taken with this, it takes great pics. I also have the Canon RF 16 millimeter. This I use for vlogging on my R6. Nice wide field of view. Uh, it's pretty fast at f2.8. That's a great lens for me just for walking around and being able to hold the camera in front of myself and be able to vlog myself. I also have the Canon 17 to 40. It's on my R6 filming me right now. I'll show you a couple of shots of it. I bought this used for about 500 bucks. I use this as my walking around landscape photography lens. It's decently sharp, stopped down to f8, f9. It's light, easy to carry around on my pack. And if I'm walking around just doing some generic landscape photography, I'm using the 17 to 40 L lens by Canon. I'll show you a couple of photos that I took with that lens. Now let's talk about the things that carry my cameras. Uh, first is this ball head. This is by Sure, which you would pronounce Sirui. Apparently it's pronounced Sure. I use this for carrying bigger lenses. I think it's the K40. This is quite a robust ball head. Most people don't need something as robust as this, but if you're carrying bigger lenses and you want a ball head rather than a gimbal, this will work very well. It also has a mechanism to swivel on the spot, which uh, I use in Milky Way photography to do panoramas where you do multiple shots. You want a ball head that can swivel on its base and it has a little meter here where you can read off how many degrees you're moving. So this is a very good product. Uh, it's got a release button so it locks on. Uh, I've used this quite a bit. Very robust, a bit heavy for what I need, but it does a great job. And when you're doing Milky Way photography at night and you're taking long exposures and it's windy, the extra bulk actually comes in handy. I also have a gimbal head. This is a Wimberly. You put your lens on here and the beauty of a gimbal is when I put this big lens on here, if I release my hand, all it does is it rocks back and forth until it finds its place. So it's kind of self-leveling. So you can drop your hands and your lens won't go crash like it will on a loose ball head. If you let go of this thing, it'll just crash down. This thing, what you do is you balance it on here and when you release it, it just stays at the same place. I don't use this a lot now because I do most of my photography with this big lens handheld actually. I like the flexibility of handheld. But if I'm gonna be on a stakeout someplace waiting for something to happen for three hours, I will bring this along. That way I can just put my lens on it 
and leave my hands in my pockets while I'm waiting. So this is a bit pricey product, but very good quality. They've been around for years. People who bought these years and years ago are still using them today. And I figure I'll have this for a long, long time. Very, very good product. When I started doing video, I found that neither the gimbal nor the ball head work really good for panning shots. So when you're shooting video of moving targets, you want that smooth panning action. Like I'll show you here a clip of something shot where you need that smooth panning action. For that, you want a video head or a fluid head. This is something like that. These are products that are made to decide either with some fluid on the inside so they move against the restriction of the fluid. This is a Manfrotto 502. It's more of an introductory model. And if you're looking to get your first video head, it's quite a good alternative. It works fairly well. It carries the weight of my big lens. And of course, when I want to pan for these panning shots, I'll show you another one now, you get that smooth movement, which is really what you want in video. You want that smooth movement across the frame. Using a gimbal or a ball head usually ends up being a bit jerky and not very smooth for your video. So this can move up and down and around. A note for people buying this, many mounts for cameras use Arca Swiss. This doesn't use Arca Swiss, it uses the man photo plate. So you need to buy an adapter. I don't know where I got this and to be honest, it was a bit hard to find. So you need to buy a Manfrotto to Arca Swiss adapter to be able to put big lenses like this on this aligned this way. There's another adapter that you can buy for smaller lenses that adapts this way when you want to put something like an L bracket. But for someone getting their first video head, this Manfrotto 502, quite a reasonable alternative for quite a reasonable price, just a few hundred dollars. While we mention Arca Swiss plates, I do have an Arca Swiss which I keep on my R5. This is a plate that has an attachment this way, it's an L bracket, and also attaches this way. That way when I'm using a ball head, I can put my camera on it this way if I'm shooting Milky Way shots, but I like shooting Milky Way shots vertically often. So all you do is put your camera this way and attaches on it, and you don't need to readjust the ball head for the same shot. So I can shoot it this way or shoot it this way, and it's got some holes and gaps in it for attaching some accessories to the plugs in the back of my camera. Now my main tripod I'm using right now is by FLM. Full disclosure, they gave me this tripod, but my deal was I tried for a month. If I enjoyed it, I'd mention something about it, and if I didn't, I'd send it back. I wouldn't be prepared to endorse a product I didn't try and I didn't like. I've been trying this for a couple of months now, and I really, really like it. It's a great tripod, very light. I like the twist knobs here. They twist. This is open and this is tight. So very small twist. Also, the legs on this thing are very long, which for me, I really enjoy because sometimes on my old tripod, I would set it up and it would be down here. And if I was trying to shoot something up a tree, I'd have to duck down. In this case, this is plenty long for me. This model is the CP34L42. It's very long. It holds this big lens and something like my Wimberly or this uh, video head really easily. I really enjoy it. There's a couple of nice features on this that I think are worth pointing out. One of the reasons you want a tripod for bird photography often is to get down low on beaches, uh, rocky shores to shoot ducks and sandpipers. But to do that, your tripod needs a couple of attributes. Number one, the legs need to go out far on the side. Make sure you get one like that. Also, don't get one with the center stock. The center stock will prohibit how far down your tripod can go. So uh, these FLM legs, number one, they move out to the side. Number two, I'll point out there's an inside button that you push out to go out. And I find that's much easier than trying to pull. You can pull these out, but it's actually easier to push them in from the inside. That's a great feature. And watch this. The best feature of this is when you go back down, they self click. I've had one before where you had to manually click it back down. So those are great features for this. FLM also sent me the matching bowl for the video head. And this is a great feature when you're doing video. When you're doing video and you're panning, you need to be level. But if you need to level by adjusting the legs, I've done it before, it's a big pain. When you wanna put this on top here and you just unscrew this, level it, and then tighten it up and push this away. This is a great feature. I really enjoy that and it works really smoothly on this. I think it's a very good product. It's very light. As you can see, it doesn't weigh anything. It looks very robust. The machining on here and the metal here looks really, really good. So I think it's gonna be a great product. It's gonna serve me uh, for a number of years. So kudos to FLM and thanks for sending me this. As for binoculars, I'm using the Nikon Monarch 5. 
These are a very, very good pair of binoculars, very popular. They're in the four to $500 range. They're often listed as the best pair of binoculars under 500 bucks. I've enjoyed these a lot, put them through a beating. These are not as sharp as the premium like Zeiss and so on, but they are much better than the consumer grade ones you're gonna find in most department stores. If you want to upgrade from a department store set of binoculars to a very good one, but without going on the premium side where they can go into several thousand dollars, this uh, Monarch 5 is very good. These are eight by 42s. A lot of people make the mistake of buying binoculars that have too much magnification and that way they're very difficult to hold steady. So eight by 42, for example, is a very popular size that gives a 6.3 degree field of view. Uh, these are waterproof. I've taken them through sand and climbing trees and all kinds of things that work very well for me. I'm looking for something that helps me identify birds and wildlife for my photography. These are very, very good. If we move over more to the accessories side of the shop here, let's talk audio, which if you're purely into photography, you might not be interested, but if a lot of people are doing more and more video and video is taking a larger and larger place in the photography space and audio is a big part of that. If you're looking to get into audio for the first time, the one thing you're gonna notice is the audio that's picked up by your cameras is not very good. The microphones in there are not very good and the preamps in there are not very good. If you're looking for the most basic upgrade to improve the audio of your wildlife videography, get a small shotgun mic. This is by Comica. I think it's $40. Make sure you've got a camera where you can plug this into the mic jack. You just put this into the hot shoe. You have a beginner wildlife videography rig because as you shoot video, you record the audio in here. These, uh, these shotgun mics are somewhat directional, so they'll pick up more of the sound right in front of you than on the sides and behind you. And this is a great way to get started at recording the singing of birds, some wildlife, some of the nature sounds that are around your wildlife a little shotgun mic will give you a big improvement over the microphone that comes with your camera. After a while, if you're doing more professional video work, you may want to upgrade. This is the Rode VideoMic NTG. This is a few hundred dollars, and it's also a powered mic, so you need to charge this. The battery lasts about 30 hours. Even though the shotgun mic, the Comica, is a big improvement over the microphone in your camera, this, again, is a big improvement over a basic mic. It has some settings for peaking, for recording two or different channels, and it has a knob on it for the input levels, which is very, very handy out in the field. This is a very good mic. Again, it's a shotgun mic. It's directional, where it's really recording in front. So when I'm recording bird singing and game right in front of me, this is what I use to capture the action. So I'll show you a clip right now of something that I've recorded using this. If you're looking to record more environmental sounds, this is a great place to start. This is the Zoom H1N. If you're looking to get your first field recorder to go out and record sounds in the field like ducks and the environment and birds singing in the spring and the sound of streams and, and uh, leaves rustling in the trees, just get one of these. I said earlier that I haven't tried them all and I'm not guaranteeing that these are the best, but this is the standard by which others are matched. It's just a little bit over $100. This is a Zoom H1N. It's got two channels, two microphones pointing this way. You can put an external microphone in it. It records on a micro SD. It's got a little jack where you can monitor your recordings. This is a great thing for going out and just recording field sounds. That being said, I prefer this for a wildlife because this is much more directional. This will point at my wildlife and I'll record the sound of the wildlife, but not the environmental sounds. This catches a bit of everything. So if you wanna capture the whole environment, this is a great place to start. On the microphone front as well, one of the weaknesses of these little shotgun mics when you're recording audio, especially when you're vlogging, is that they pick up a lot more sound than you want and they pick up too much from your environment. Here's a bit of footage from when I'm on a windy beach, for example. Hey everyone, so I'm back at the beach. The solution to that is wearing a lapel mic. That is a lapel mic that catches the sound close to your face but not the external sound. And that way you come up with much better audio, especially when it's really, really windy. So right here, this is the Rode Wireless Go 2. So there's a transmitter on top of my camera 
plugged into the side of my camera and I'm speaking into this and it's transmitting wirelessly. So I could step back 50 or 100 feet and speak with a normal voice and it would still pick up my sound and not pick up a lot of the environmental sound. So if you're doing a lot of vlogging or if you're recording people shooting interviews and you want to catch their voice with a very good quality, but you don't want to catch a lot of external noise, you want to get a lav mic or a lapel mic that has a cord that people can put on their collar or get one of these remote ones. This one, uh, this Rode Wireless Go 2 is really, really good. I'm really enjoying it. It's easy to use and I just uh, put it on my clothing. I also use some filters. I have a polarizer for when you're shooting waterfalls and you want to adjust how much of the reflected light you want to show in your photo. And I've got some neutral density filters that I use to reduce the amount of light in my image to take long, slow exposures like this photo right here. Or I use it to reduce the amount of light when I'm shooting video. You see, video is shot at very low shutter speeds, but at those very low shutter speeds, what happens is sometimes you can't get your ISO low enough to be able to not overexpose your photo. So either when I'm vlogging or I'm shooting wildlife with this 100 to 400 lens, these 77 millimeter uh, neutral density filters will fit. And I've got a two stop, four stop, six stop, and 10 stop that I use for some videography, as well as taking long exposures of things like waterfalls. Then I've got a drone. I've got the DJI Air 2S. So this comes in two variants, the Air 2 and the Air 2S. The Air 2S, as was described to me, is the photographer's model. If you really care about the quality of your videography and your photos, get the 2S. The S model has the bigger sensor. Uh, so this is a fantastic gadget. I bought the Flymore package with two extra batteries, some neutral density filters for shooting video. And this is a great device. It comes with a controller that you put your phone on. This is a fantastic thing for quite a reasonable price, I thought. I have to give a shout out to the people who design not just the hardware, but the software for this. The software that operates it is just fantastic. If it gets out of connective range, it'll just fly back to you. And if you want to walk and you want it to do a circling shot around you while you're walking, you just two clicks and it does it automatically. So this is a fantastic addition to my YouTube videos and I'm starting to shoot some more professional work on it. I'll show you a bit of footage that I've shot with this. Uh, this is a great product. I really, really enjoy it. So you can't do a what's in the bag without talking about the bag. So a little interlude about the bags here that didn't fit on the table along with everything else. So for bags here, I've got uh, a low pro bag here. This is the flip side 300. This is basically just a small bag for when I'm doing uh, Milky Way photography, landscape photography. If I just want to carry a small tripod, handful of lenses and, and a, a camera body, I'll take this. It's very small, very light, easy to carry. And uh, I've gotten it dirty a bit and it seems to be holding out pretty well. If I want to be doing uh, airplane travel, for example, and I need a very thickly padded bag for protection for my lenses and gear, I'll use this low pro bag. Here it is here, for example, showing that it fits my 400 in there. This is the ProRunner BP450 AW2. I've got some extra of these things, uh, these separators that I have. So I usually put this lens in the middle and I'll put these separators here on the sides. I can fit uh, another lens there, an extra camera body, an extra camera body, and a teleconverter. And I can usually squish all of that into this bag. So if I'm traveling air travel, this is the bag that I'll use. It's got lots of pockets for accessories here. I put my batteries and cards in here. I put cords and other accessories here and so on. We'll fit uh, underneath uh, the seat of most planes and on the overhead as well. And if I'm hiking, this is what I'll be using. It's a Mindshift Ultralight Dual 36L. So it's a 36 liter bag. Its main features are, it's got a compartment here where this is actually removable. I could take this right out. And this is where you put some of your camera uh, accessories. So a camera body, a couple of lens, and a few accessories will fit in there, although it won't carry my big 500, for example. But this is more for landscape and long range hiking and so on. And then uh, in the top here, there's a few places. There's a zipper here with a few, I put my filters and so on in there. What I do here, in here is a pouch that is quite expandable in terms of its size in that, you know, my hand will go quite deep in there. There's actually a, a, a a portal in the back. I could put my hand all the way down here if I want. You could put a laptop or something in there, I think. It has quite adaptable in terms of its size. Uh, and then once you tie it up, this can clip up pretty good. It comes with a rain cover over the whole thing. 
It's, uh, it's quite good for hiking, quite comfortable on me. And it's got a few places for a water bottle, for example, thermos. Uh, and if you want to hook a tripod in the back, you can as well. This is a, a very good hiking bag, uh, which I use as well. Let's go back to the rest of my gear. Getting more into accessories, uh, power becomes a big deal when you're out in the field and you've got powered microphones, you've got cameras, you've got drones, you need power. So I've got this Jackery. I don't know what the model number is, but I'll put a link down below uh, with the right model number. These are a fantastic device. This is a big lithium ion battery, basically. I charge this up, it'll run my astrophotography rig for six, seven or eight hours. And I don't know how many phone charges I could get out of this, but it's probably dozens and dozens and dozens. So if the power goes out, you've got something like this, or if you're on the road for a few days and you need something to charge up your devices. Some people buy solar panels as well to be able to help charge these back up. But uh, this is a great device with some USB ports, some traditional wall outlets, as well as a cigarette lighter for 12 volts. So this is a great device, great when you're on the road. Sometimes you want something a bit smaller. I've got this little device here by EFU, E-A-F-U. This holds about four or five charges of your cell phone, and basically it's a pocket charger. It's got a little uh, display here showing you how much power you have left, which is a great feature on these things, by the way. I wouldn't buy one of these that doesn't tell you how much power. So this one says 100. I've got 100% of the charge left on it, because if you don't know how much charge is left on it, uh, you don't know how to you know, preserve your battery power. This is great if your phone is running low, you just plug your phone through a USB-C or a USB-3 in the back and chuck it in your pocket. And while you're walking around, it'll charge your phone. So great little device. Next, you need memory cards, especially when you're shooting video, you use up a lot of space. So you need big high capacity memory cards and you need them fast. I love shooting 4K and I love shooting 4K 120 slow motion. You need really, really fast cards for that because the, the bit rate needed to transfer that data is huge. So for the last few years, I've been using the ProGrade uh, and these have been serving me really well. Here I've got a gold 128. I also own two of the Cobalt 325 gigabytes. The Cobalt is actually the step above the gold and I've got two of these 325s. They're not cheap and they're so small you worry about lo losing them. Then batteries, you need lots of batteries. These are the Canon LPE6 and I've got some of the ENDS which are the second latest generation. And then I've got these as well. That is the latest generation, the LP E6 and H. And these are the ones that came with the R system cameras. Uh, they have about 10% more charge than the older ones. So I've got three of the newer ones and two of the older ones. So I've got five of these batteries because I've got two cameras. I've got the uh, R5 and the R6 and I'm shooting video and shooting wildlife and uh, keeping the cameras on for a long time. So uh, I need lots of batteries. Then I got remote shutter releases and intervalometers. This is one by SM Development, not particularly expensive. I use this for photographing crashing waves uh, when you're just sitting there waiting for the wave to show up and you just hit the button remotely. I'll show you a photo where I'm doing that. And this is an intervalometer. I bought this on Amazon for less than 20 bucks. If you wanna take multiple exposures in a row, timed. A lot of modern cameras come with a built-in intervalometer, my R5, my R6, my 5D Mark IV before that did. So I tend not to use this a lot, but this can also double as a shutter release if you want to be photographing waves or a number of Milky Way shots, for example, back to back. I also use camera straps. I've got two here. These are by Black Rapid. I've been using Black Rapid for a number of years. They've never failed me. The connections are very strong. They stay in fairly well. I've got a lighter one and a more heavy one. When I hike with these lenses, I tend to put a strap across my shoulder. I don't use the neck strap around my neck. I hang it on the side and I use these Black Rapid straps and uh, I've always been confident that they're in good shape. I also have some lights that I use. These two lights, this is just a cheap light I bought at. Canadian store, Canadian Tire. I use this for painting Milky Way shots. When you're taking a nighttime shot of the Milky Way and you want to light the foreground a little bit, you can use an external light, which you just kind of wave around while you're taking a long exposure. So I'll show you a photo where I use this light to do that. 
And I also have an LED panel. This is a more sophisticated version. This light here, you can actually change the brightness. You can actually change the color temperature on this light as well. I use this a little bit for light painting, but also shooting my YouTube videos if I need some extra light. You can adjust the color temperature to make sure it matches the scene. Uh, if you're doing any Milky Way photography, you need a headlamp. This one is a Coleman. This one takes batteries. One of these days I'll need to buy one that charges via USB and I can just keep recharging it. But I've got two or three of these. I've got one in my camera bag, one in my vehicle, one in my glove compartment. I always have a few of these around. And these are basically lights for putting on your forehead for when you're going out and doing Milky Way photography. I'm not gonna cover clothing in detail because you could do a whole other video on that. But I do wanna point out two pieces of clothing that I've really enjoyed and I think are more deserving of a shout out than most of the clothing that I own. Number one are gloves. I tend not to spend lots of money on my clothing for wildlife photography. I'll go out and buy a camo jacket and I'll buy some rain gear and, and so on. But uh, somewhere where I found that not spending money didn't serve me well was in gloves. I buy a pair of gloves every year. And after scrounging in the mud and the cold and crawling on beaches at the end of a year, if I had an inexpensive pair of gloves, they were just gone and beat. So I finally bit the bullet and bought these Heat 3 gloves. These are really, really good. They come with an insert, so I've got merino wool inserts. These zip up, you can put a little heat pad in the back. These are very, very good gloves. Uh, so I really enjoy these. You can get some fingers out. You can also get the thumb out. And these have magnetic tabs to attach to the back. So these are by the Heat Company. And these are called, I think they're called Heat 3. These are really good gloves. Uh, I really enjoy these. Also a pair of pants actually, I want to point out. These are Fjall Ravens and these are G1000s. I only got these recently, but I've been scrounging in the rocks and the beaches and so on. And you put these in the washing machine and they come out looking like brand new. I think these are gonna last a long, long time. They got tons of pockets. They really wear well when you're hiking. They don't drag down, even though you've got a whole bunch of stuff in your pockets like teleconverters and batteries and so on. Uh, so these are Fjall Ravens G1000s. Uh, they're expensive, of course, but I think these are gonna last me a long, long time. Something I didn't cover are my neoprene covers. So I've got some neoprene on my big lens here. I've got these neoprene bags that I put my camera bodies in and I've got this waterproof cover that I put on my big 500 millimeter lens if it's raining. This lens is water resistant slash waterproof but you want a little extra protection. These are by Lenscoat, a US company and I've got several versions of these for my lenses neoprene covers for my lens and neoprene bags for my camera bodies. Underneath my R6 right now is my Sure, which is the same company that makes this ball head. It's a Traveler 7C. It's a very good tripod. The legs uh, can move all the way out and also click on the way down, which again, a great feature. It's a smaller tripod that I use for landscape photography or when I'm vlogging. It's great, it's been working really well for me. It's a light form factor, made of carbon fiber. I'll show you a picture of it right now so you can see it even though it's sitting underneath my R6. And finally, I promised to show you my astrophotography rig. Let's switch to that now. And here is my astrophotography rig. Here, I'll get you in a little closer. This is more accurately called an astrograph as uh, it's not appropriately called a telescope because you actually can't look through it through an eyepiece. This is actually for photography only. This is made by Celestron and it's nicknamed the Raza, which is short for a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. It's an F2 400 millimeter design. The way this works is the light actually comes in through the front end right there and there's a mirror in the back. I don't know whether or not there's any way that I can put this in a location. I think you can actually see the mirror right there in the back. This is a design invented by Isaac Newton. The light comes in the back, is, is de facto magnified by a curved mirror in the back that sends it back to the front in a smaller cone, which comes to rest inside this red gadget, which is my camera. I'll show you the camera here. This right here is my astrophotography camera. Right there is a sensor just like on your digital camera. I say just like, actually not just like. There's two main differences of this camera, which is dedicated for astrophotography than a regular terrestrial camera. Number one, it's got cooling. See this fans and this fan has got a cooling fan. It's got cooling because astrophotography is done with long exposures. Long exposures build up noise and they build up heat. 
So this actually, the back of the sensor is cooled so it doesn't get too noisy during long exposures. Secondly, terrestrial cameras have a filter that cuts out infrared light and cuts out a lot of the beautiful red light that's found in nebulas. I'll show you a photo now. That includes a lot of light that comes at a wavelength of hydrogen alpha and terrestrial cameras have a filter that cut that out. This one doesn't have that filter, so it's much more sensitive to red than a regular terrestrial camera. On the back here, we have a few different things. There's a separate scope here called a guide scope. It actually has its own little camera. What this scope does, it points across here at a star and it keeps it aligned on that star. If it ever drifts, it sends corrections to my telescope mount, which I'm not gonna show you, it's another big piece of gear, and makes small corrections to make sure that this is always pointed at my target. Also in the back here, I have a few accessories. This is a power pack that I use to control all the power related to this. This is a temperature sensor. This is used to turn on my dew heaters. These are actually straps that warm the front of my lens because uh, under the wrong conditions, this front element here gets all full of dew, which of course you can't photograph through. And I'll move this around to show you another great piece of gear. This is uh, an ASI Air Pro. It's a small Raspberry Pi computer. And this through my iPad is what controls all of this in my telescope. So this is a genius little device, 400 bucks. I connect it to my iPad and using my iPad, I can use this to take, uh, to take photos with this, control my camera, take individual exposures, see my exposures, control my telescope mount, do all kinds of things, including finding targets in the sky. I just program into this using my iPad, what target I want to see, and it will slew the telescope using my mount to actually find the target. It'll take a test photo, and if it finds it's a little bit off, because it knows the stars in the region, it'll make adjustments and center the object in my field of view. So this is my astrophotography rig, as I mentioned earlier. This is 400 millimeters F2. So it's really fast, brings in lots of light, which you need because astrophotography is shot taking very, very dark subjects. Uh, nebulas and galaxies and so on are very faint and they're very dark, so you need to take multiple exposures and you need to stack multiple minutes and hours of exposures to get good astrophotos. I'll show you now a few photos that I've taken with this setup. Hey everyone, that's a wrap. I really hope you enjoyed my walkthrough of my equipment and I hope to see you soon on some more YouTube adventures.